In verse 14, when it says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, that is written there to remind you that since God has given to us His Holy Spirit, we don't need to live in the flesh, that is to be led by the flesh. But we can be led by the Spirit. Now, you couldn't be led by the Spirit unless you had the Spirit. And according to Romans chapter 8, that when you believed on Jesus Christ, you were sealed or indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Verse 9 says, uh, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Every believer, upon believing on Jesus Christ, not only has been justified by faith by God, but has been indwelt by the Spirit of God. And, and that tells us, then, that God is going to work in our life a different way. Uh, the, the reason it says in verse uh, 15, for we have... For, uh, we have not received the spirit of uh, bondage again to fear. It's referring to we're not, we haven't been given the law. The law was given to the nation of Israel with a strong warning that if you break it, you're going to be chastened. And so they, they lived and served God out of fear all the time. Fear that they would be cut off from God. Fear that if they would step out of line and break his laws that he would punish them. They constantly lived their life in fear. But we haven't been given the spirit of fear. We've been given the spirit of life. And uh, we've been given, uh, and, and by the Holy Spirit that's in us, we're not led by the law as the means by which we're to walk before God, but we're actually led from the inside by God's Spirit. And God's Spirit uses the Word of God to lead and to guide us in life. And that's why verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's, that's telling you, how you are to live your Christian life today based on what God has said in his word by the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is going to use God's word in your life and will lead you. You don't have to be ignorant of what God wants, but the Holy Spirit is there and, the, and you're to follow the leading of the Spirit. And that's why the verses all talk about walking after the Spirit. And, uh, and then verse 15, we're not given the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, someone I don't think I ever said last week why the term Abba is there. Abba is a term, well, I did say that is, is a term that Jesus Christ only used in the Bible in reference to his father because it's a, it's a term of endearment. It, the closest that I know that we have in our vernacular that's close to Abba, Father, would be to say Daddy. I mean, it's one thing to call God Father. It's another thing to look at him as your dad. And, and that, that just shows the intimacy that we have with God the Father because of the fact that we have been given the spirit of adoption. And the spirit of adoption has made us sons of God, but, but not just in the sense that we're now children of God, much more than that, mature sons of God. Sons of God that are now able to make our own decisions about some things in life, of how we're going to live. God doesn't dictate by law how we're to live. He, he gives us his grace and gives us his spirit and says, now, walk as dear children. You're not to be a disobedient child of God. You're supposed to be an obedient child of God. But you've been given the spirit of adoption whereby you make some decisions in life on how you're going to live and, and what you're going to do in this life and how you're going to glorify God. It's not all spelled out. You have some liberty that's in Christ Jesus, but you're not lib given liberty just to go and live in the flesh. You've been given liberty to walk in the spirit and to be led by the spirit to accomplish some things. And, you know, that's one of the most amazing things to realize that we only have this life to live for the Lord. I mean, this life's going by quick, I'll tell you that. And whatever, left, whatever time you have left in this life, this is the only time that you have in this lifetime, in this world, to make it count for God. Now, wouldn't you wish he would say, well, I want you to do five things before you die? But he doesn't. He says, just whatever you do in word and deed, do it for my glory. Now, that means that you can actually think about how do I want to glorify God in my life and then go after it. That's how this idea of a TV program, there's so much junk on the TV airways, not only the sinful carnality of Hollywood, but also the religious world is putting, on false doc putting out false doctrine. Why can't there be a message of grace out there? Well, why can't there? There can't. There's no reason there can't be. And as we got thinking about it, all we got to do is do it, and all it's going to take is money. Well, money's just going to be left behind when we die, so... And, and, and so that's how this idea about the, uh, forgot, uh, the Forgotten Truths ministry began. 
Let's figure out a way to do it, and let's try it. If we fail, so what? If we succeed, we'll help some people. In the meantime, we're trying to do it for God. We only got this life. Would it be a shame to die and realize there's a million things we could have done, never even thought of them, or were too afraid to try? Well, see, this is what it means to be son of God. God didn't lay out what we should do. He just said, whatever you do in word and deed, do it for my glory. And now we have an opportunity to decide to make our life count for God in all kinds of different ways. That's just one little way, but all kinds of different ways that as a son, we make those decisions. We're adults. We are given the opportunity to make some decisions in life and to be responsible for those decisions because we'll all give an account to God about how we spent our life. So there is responsibility that comes with adulthood. So you got, uh, uh, you got uh, um, some opportunity and responsibility and accountability, uh, and, and, and you're not left to yourself. You have the wisdom of God in the Scriptures and the Spirit to lead us. And that's what the spirit of adoption is. And, and so we've been given that spirit. Now, with that spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, it says in verse 16, the spirit itself also beareth with witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That is, that we belong to him and will be eternally joined with God. I have believed on Jesus Christ, and I've called out in my spirit unto God to be my Savior. God's spirit has come in, come in and has, has witnessed along with my spirit that I am God's child. A witness, a double, twofold witness has been confirmed that I'm a child of God. I'm eternally God's child. And, and now because I'm eternally God's child, verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be also glorified together. So there's four things as we leave verse 17 that I want you to remember, and we'll look at the last one more right now. The first was is that we are sons of God. That is... The Holy Spirit is in us, and not just we're not just children, we're sons, adult sons, able to make some decisions and be responsible for those decisions, but also as an adult son, you're now made of age of, 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 of being an heir, of being able to be an heir of God. And that's why it goes on to say in verse 17, and if children, then heirs. To be an heir of God, what you would understand from that is to be an heir is that you have on, on the most basic level, you're heirs of everlasting life. You're, you have an inheritance into the kingdom of God. The unbeliever doesn't have an inheritance of, in the kingdom of God. Those who are unrighteous have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. But we've been declared righteous by God, and we've been given the spirit of adoption so that we're, we're sons of God, and, and if we're children of God, then we're also heirs of God. We're heirs of eternal life. We're going to live forever. That's what it means to be an heir of God. But it says, and if an heir, it says, and a joint heir with Christ. So we're not just an heir of God, we are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That is, now we're not talking about just inheriting life, but what is it in life that we're going to inherit? And we saw last week that everything in heaven and earth, Jesus Christ is going to inherit. In fact, I'd like to show it to you this way. Go back with me to, first get Matthew chapter 19. Now, this has to do with being a joint heir with Christ. Christ is going to inherit all things. We quickly saw last week that's all things in heaven and earth. We'll look again at Colossians and see that again today in just, just a second. But in chapter 19 of Matthew, in verse 28, I'll start with verse 27, it says, Then Peter said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, ye which followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken house, or brother, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. So they're not only going to, is there a promise of life, but there's an inheritance in life, being a joint heir with Christ. Peter says, we followed you, what are we going to receive? He says, when I sit in the throne of my glory, when I return from heaven and establish my throne here on earth, you twelve will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They're going to reign with Christ in a very predominant way. Israel, Jerusalem, is going to be the capital of the world. Jesus Christ will be king of the earth. But the twelve apostles will be under him on twelve thrones ruling over Israel. 
and it's Israel who's a nation, a king, a royal nation, a kingdom of priests that will be ruling over the nations. So they're giving a place, a preeminence, a principality, a position in the reigning of, uh, with Jesus Christ on this earth. That's what they're going to inherit. That's how they are a joint heir with Christ. As he's going to inherit everything, they're going to have a place with him on this earth, ruling with him. In fact, when I say on this earth, look back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. No, 32 it is. God's purpose for the nation of Israel is to restore this earth unto the authority of Jesus Christ. And it's been God's uh, intent from the very beginning when he created the earth to, for Jesus Christ to reign over this earth and when he separated out the nation of Israel and made them his special people, it is for the purpose of setting up the kingdom in Israel over all the earth. And you can see that in this Deuteronomy 32 that it was in God's mind on how to divide the earth up. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, i got to get there. In verse 7, it says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask thy father, and he will show thee, and thy elders, and they will tell thee, when the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. That is, when God divided people up on this earth, he divided them in a division of the number of Israel. Well, Israel has 12 tribes, don't they? So this earth, the nations of this earth, has been divided into 12. And then it says in verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. That is, the nation of Israel is God's people that's going to rule over this earth, and when he divided the people up in this earth, he divided in this earth into sections of 12. And you know, I, every time I read that verse, I can't help but just thinking of the globe sitting in my, in my well, it's at home, it's not my office here, it's at home. But it, that, that globe is divided into 24 time zones, a division of 12, isn't it? That is, two, two time zones would make up if you divided each time zone into one section, there'd be 12 divisions on this earth. This earth is divided into 12. And the people of this earth are divided into 12 according to God's number of the nation of Israel because they are his inheritance, and through Israel, Jesus Christ is going to rule over this earth. So when they, for them to say that they're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, is they're going to share in the reign of Jesus Christ over the earth. But come to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. God today is not dealing with Israel. He's turned to us Gentile. He's, uh, Gentiles. He's saving us by his grace. He's placed us into one body. We're the body of Christ. And, uh, and he did it for a reason. And Colossians tells us clearly what the reason is. It says in Colossians 1.12, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and have translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. You know, when you, when, when you read that about the power of darkness, don't just think that God delivered you from, from your sins, the darkness of your sins, and placed you into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. When God looked down before, before the Apostle Paul went to the nations, and before God opened the door of faith to us Gentiles, when God would look down in this world, there was his people, the nation of Israel, and then the rest of the people were idolatrous people, children of the devil. So when it says that he hath translated us from the power of darkness, he's not just talking about your sin in your individual life. He's taken us Gentiles who were, who were the army of the devil, who were enslaved and belonged to the devil, and translated us into the kingdom of God's dear son. That's what's going on in the age of grace. God's saving us Gentiles who long has belonged to Satan worshiping idols, which is nothing but a devil, according to 1 Corinthians 10. But, he has but we're to give thanks, for he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated unto us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Well, where's our place with his Son? Well, it says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, that is by Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. 
Now, when you think of all things, you need to think about all things. And remember, all things isn't just here on earth. All things that were created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so God had, Jesus Christ is the firstborn from the dead, and he is the one who created all things. Not just all things on earth, but all things in heaven and all things that are on earth. And the things that are in heaven and on earth are described to us as well. It says visible and invisible. Well, I can see the ones on earth. I can't see the ones in heaven, but they're there. And it says whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That is, Jesus Christ not only created the heavenly places and the earth itself, but the ruling authority that are over the heavens and are over the earth, Jesus Christ created them also. They were not only created by him, they were created for him. That is, for him to rule over and to pre be preeminent in the heavens and in the earth. Now we know how Jesus Christ is going to be preeminent in all the earth, don't we? It's through the kingdom of the nation of Israel. But God didn't want him just to be preeminent in the earth. He wants him to be preeminent in the heavens. Do you know where Satan is today? He's in heaven. He's not down in hell in a bottomless pit or wherever people think he's at. The Bible says we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers in heavenly places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan and his angels are still free, running throughout the heavens, corrupting the government of the heavens. When you read Revelation 12, they're going to be thrown out. But if, there's, if the heavenly government is corrupt, like the earthly government is corrupt, and God is going to use the nation of Israel to make all, this, all the earth be under the ruleship of Jesus Christ and bring a kingdom of peace to this earth by Jesus Christ setting up a kingdom in Israel and the earth being divided up among, by the number of the nation of Israel, how is God going to cleanse the heavens? And when he throws them out, who's the government of the heavens? Well, watch this. He created it all by, they were all created by him and for him. And he is before all things, that is, he comes first, and by him all things consist. He, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. That's who we are. God has formed the church, the body of Christ. Why? Well, Jesus Christ is the head of it, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might be preeminent in all things. Oh, we know what all things means. All things in heaven and all things in earth. God wanted Jesus Christ to be preeminent, not just in the earth, but in all things, the heaven as well. And that's why Jesus Christ formed the body of Christ. That's why Jesus Christ is the head of the body of the church, which is what we are, is so that he can be preeminent not just in earth, but in all things, heaven and earth. So our part of the inheritance of Christ is in the heavens. For, it says in verse 19, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. We are being saved for a purpose of not just having being an heir of life and entering into the kingdom of God, to be a joint heir with Christ, and Christ is going to inherit all things heaven and earth. But it's through the nation of Israel that Jesus Christ will be preeminent in the earth, and it's through the members, you and I believers today, that Jesus Christ is going to, we're going to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We're already seated with Christ by our calling, but we're going to be taken off this earth into the heavens someday and seated out there in the heavenly places so that Jesus Christ might be preeminent in all things. That's the purpose for us. So when you're going to be an heir of Christ or a joint uh, a heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, there is not only eternal life, but there is a position to receive in life with Jesus Christ, reigning at some position in heaven. And, and not only that, before I leave Colossians, look at chapter 3. This is so important for you to understand God's purpose for you because we live in a time where the earth, the people, believers today are so caught up in the materialistic, physical, whether it be their body or their finances or their possessions here on earth, it's, it, it's all caught up in the material things of the earth. When you and I, we're going to leave all of this behind. I mean, Israel is going to have an inheritance in the earth. That land, for the, according, a Jew who is under the kingdom program, that land is eternally important for them to hang on to, to own that piece of land here on earth because they're going to be raised and inherit that land forever. But the land that you own now, you're going to give it up and never inherit a piece of this earth because God's purpose for us is in the heavenly places. And, and so you read in Colossians chapter 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, 
Seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on the earth. For ye are, for ye are hid, uh, no, for, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. You and I, since God's calling for us is the heavenly places, we're not to have affections for the things of this earth. Now, we have them, we need them, to use them for God's glory, to get ourselves around, to live through this life. But to be so attached that our heart is on this earth, when we're to set our affections on the heavenly things, because Christ is going to come and we're going to be manifested with him up in glory, and so we need to set our affections there. We need to live for that pers- purpose even now, because we're a joint heir with Christ, and the part that we're going to share in with Christ is the reigning in the heavenly places. Now come back to Romans chapter 8. So we've learned what it means to be a son, what it means to be an heir, what it means to be a joint heir with Christ. But that 8.17 said one more thing. It says, And if children, then heirs of God, uh, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, sometimes in your Bible, if means if, and it might not be true. Or like we just read in Colossians 3, if ye be dead with Christ, seek those things that are above. That Paul's writing to believers, and he's saying, not if, and you may be not, he's saying since you're dead with Christ. And I believe when I look at this verse, I think he's talking about all believers being glorified together. And, and, and when it says, if ye suffer with him, well, that's what we've been learning since Romans chapter 6. That you, when you believed on Jesus Christ, you've been placed into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have suffered with him. You've been placed into his death, burial, and resurrection. And you've been placed in his death, burial, and resurrection so that you might be, we might be glorified together with him. God's going to glorify his son. And he's going to glorify him throughout the universe, and we're going to be part of his son's glory. But, but I'm going to take you a step further than that and realize that there's not only that we're all going to be glorified, every believer, we're going to be glorified. In fact, that's, well, I get ahead of myself, but look at Romans chapter 8 and verse, uh, verse 30. Moreover, and we'll explain these verses later, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Uh, look at Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 2. Verse 5, we're justified by faith. And then verse 2 says, By whom? By Christ. Romans 5, 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in what? The hope of the glory of God. We're going to share in in the glory of God. And God's glory is all going to be centered in Jesus Christ. And if you've died with Christ, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for you, God has placed you into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you have died with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 17, when it says, if you have suffered with Christ, it doesn't say, if you have suffered for Christ. If you have suffered with him, if you've been placed into his sufferings, his death, burial, and resurrection, you're going to be glorified. But there is also another truth that the Apostle Paul teaches that you need to know on top of this truth. Not only can you count on the fact that you, if you've died with Christ, you're going to be glorified together. We are going to be glorified together with him. That's a fact. But there is going to be degrees of how you're going to be glorified together with Christ based on your service for him. And that's what rewards are all about. So you are going to be glorified together, but there is additional glories that you can receive. First, come to Philippians chapter 3. It says in verse 20, and by the way, this, this, the context of this passage is warning you about teachers who mind earthly things warning you that's wrong, that's evil, their God is their belly if they're they're minding earthly things. But we're to mind heavenly things because verse 20 says, for our conversation, our lifestyle, our life is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. That is, we're, going in the, we're, we're not to be looking on this earth because we're looking for Christ to come from heaven and he's going to change our bodies like unto his glorious body. And he's going to take us into the heavens. 
and, and we're going to be, we're going to be, if we're changed into the glory of Jesus Christ, then God is going to glorify his son throughout the heavens and throughout the earth by the resurrected body that we're going to be raised with. So we are going to share in Christ's glory and be a part of that glory. But not only are we going to share in that glory, come over with me to, um, oh, which one first? Uh, let's do it this way, 2 Timothy. Now, when you understand this truth, it, it has an impact in your life. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7 says, Consider what I say, 2 Timothy 2, 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now, Paul's praying that you'll understand exactly what he means here, because this could go over your head. He says, Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, you know what? Jesus Christ is called the seed of David so because he's going to reign over the earth. But Paul says, now I'm saying something different, catch this. Jesus Christ, was the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. For a heavenly reason, not just an earthly reason. Still the same person, Jesus Christ, still the seed of David, but not just to reign over the earth like David did, but to reign over the heavens. And Paul says, now understand this. And then he says this. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Preaching about Jesus Christ... According to the gospel given to Paul, Paul suffers for it. Now, this is suffering for Christ, a little different than suffering with Christ. It's not just by faith and entering into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is now going out and testifying what God is doing and people getting mad at you for it. In fact, threatening to kill you and once tried, several times tried. Paul says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That is, not only obtain salvation, but get something along with your salvation, an eternal glory, a glory that's going to last forever. The standard glory? No, watch this. It says, it is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Well, anybody who's trusted Jesus Christ has died with Christ. We've been placed into his death, burial, and resurrection. And so it's a faithful saying. You can count on this. If you've died with Christ, what can you count on? You're going to live with him. Just like he rose from the dead, you're going to raise from the dead, you're going to spend eternal life with, with Jesus Christ. That, that you can count on. But then he adds something. If we suffer... Now here he's talking about the suffering that he's going through, preaching Jesus Christ according to the, the message given to him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Not just live, but reign. Just like the 12 tribes are going to sit, uh, the 12 apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, God has got a place for us in heaven, and in heaven there's principalities, powers, and dominions, and might in heaven. And if we'll suffer for Jesus Christ now, suffer for his cause, we'll not only have life with Jesus Christ, we'll reign with Jesus Christ. It says, if we deny him, that is, I'm a believer who I want everything to go nice and easy. I don't want anyone to get mad at me. I don't want to rustle, ruffle any feathers. I just want to go through life nice and smooth. And I know if I live for the Lord, I'm going to suffer persecution. If I speak up, people are going to get mad at me. I'll just keep my mouth shut. I won't tell people I'm a Christian. I'll just show up on Sunday, go home and live like the world on Monday through Saturday and, and just, just not make this life count for God at all. I'll, I'll deny him in the sense that I won't live for him. It says if we deny him, he shall deny us. The context is if we suffer, we reign. If we deny him, he denies us the reigning position. Can he deny us eternal life? No, the faithful saying is if we died with him, we're going to live. He can't deny us eternal life. In fact, the next verse goes on to even say that. It says uh, if we believe not, that is, change your mind, decide I'm, I'm not a believer, I'm not going to live as a believer, I'm going to be unfaithful. That's what to believe not is all about. Yet, he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He's made us one. We're going to live together with him. So no matter what you do, he's going to be faithful and save you if you've trusted in him. If you've died with him, you're going to live. But now you have an opportunity to choose. If I suffer for him, I'm going to reign. Somewhere I'm going to reign with him. And if I deny him through this life, he'll deny me that position of reigning, but he'll give me life because he is faithful. 
Now that, when I say somewhere reigning, I know it's in heaven that I'm going to share with Christ, but if there's principalities, power, dominion, might, and as Ephesians says, every name that is named, <laughs> there's a general public in heaven, but there are also positions, higher places in heaven, just like there are higher authority on this earth. And your reigning position depends on your willingness to live and to suffer for him now. So look at one more passage before we go back to Romans, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here's where Paul lists all the sufferings that he's going through. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says in verse 8, 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. And he just goes on to talk about all the, all the things working against him, how he bears in his body the dying of the Lord Jesus. People are out to kill him. He talks about all these things, and, but he says this. He says, verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now, if you live to be 100 years old, you're an old person in this life, aren't you? But if you have eternal life, and you've been enjoying eternal life for one billion years, that's just the beginning, right? What is 100 years based on the billion years, which is the beginning of eternal life? It's a moment. That's what Paul, Paul's looking at this life in light of the eternal promise that God has given us. And whatever we suffer in this life, he calls it a light affliction because you can suffer anything for a moment, can't you? And that's all this life is, is but a moment. He says, for, this, for, for our light affliction, which is but for, by the way, he's talking about being stoned too, <laughs> shipwreck and everything else, he calls it light because it's just for a moment. It says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When God divides out the glory, we're all going to be glorified. We're all going to share in the glory of Jesus Christ, right? That there's degrees, there's weights of glory. And, and when, he, when we suffer for him, there, we will receive that suffering is working for us, just like money in the bank trying to invest interest you're investing your life in spiritual things and you're suffering for it, but that is working in your behalf a far more. That is, it'll exceed any suffering you've ever gone through. You're going to get a lot more than what you've ever suffered. And it's eternal. It's going to last a lot longer than what you're suffering now is. Weight of glory. There are degrees of glory in heaven. And our suffering, what we do for the Lord now, is going to be rewarded with a weight of glory based on that suffering. While, it says in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're going to last only a short time. But the things which are not seen, our heavenly position with Christ, they are eternal, aren't they? So the way that we will go through those light afflictions for this moment is we've got to keep our eyes and our affections on things above, on the things that we can't see. Knowing that they're real, knowing that God has promised, knowing we're not only an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, that there's an, there were, the suffering now is working an eternal weight of glory. So don't give up suffering. Suffer for God while you have the opportunity. Choose to suffer for the Lord while you have the opportunity. And, and the weight of glory will come later. Keep your eyes fixed on glory. Now that's, that's a lesson you need to understand because you will suffer in this life. Go back to Romans chapter 8. Now, when you understand what we just talked about, that you're a son, an heir, a joint heir with Christ, and you're going to be glorified, and yet in being glorified, there is degrees of glory, weights of glory that you can receive, then chapter uh, 8 of Romans, verses 18 through 25, is going to tell us how to go through this life and, and make it through suffering. Suffering, even though Paul said it's but for a moment, when you're in the middle of it, seems like it's forever, doesn't it? So there is some information that's going to help us here. In, in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Now whether you just get the standard glory 
or you get an exceeding weight of glory, whatever amount of glory you get, Paul is saying here that whatever the sufferings of this present time, they're not going to be worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Now, you know, I look in this earth and I see some, fan, not fantastic, that's the wrong word, some terrible, severe suffering that you just wonder how anyone can bear that kind of suffering. But you look at the worst calamity that you've ever seen on this earth and the worst suffering you've ever seen and remember that verse there. Now this is looking with faith to something we can't see, but the Bible says that whatever that suffering is, that once we're in eternity and we look back, we're going to say that was nothing compared to what God has rewarded us with. It's not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Now, when you look at that verse with the eyes of faith, that'll help you when you're suffering. Because that's the purpose of these verses, is to equip you to be able to suffer. And the first equipping is to knowing that our hope of glory, well, if, if it's not worthy to be compared, just having that hope and knowing that hope will help you to bear with the suffering. Because when I look at verse 18, and it says, the sufferings of this present time, hope you understand that the age of grace, God has interrupted the coming of Jesus Christ down to this earth to put away sin and to bring peace and righteousness to this earth. God has postponed that. So guess what? There's not going to be peace on this earth, and there's not going to be righteousness on this earth all the time Jesus Christ has postponed that. In fact, the Apostle Paul calls it the long suffering of God, and Peter does too. That we live in a time of long suffering. And that's why Paul writes here about the present time. This present time, what you can count on the fact that there are many sufferings. The sufferings of this present time. Sufferings is plural. And what you can count on from now until Jesus Christ takes you home to glory or you die. There's not just suffering. There are sufferings. There are many sufferings in this life. The other is that the sufferings are great that are in this life but not worthy to be compared to the greatness of the glory that's going to be revealed. But the suffering, there is many sufferings, and, and, and there can be great sufferings. Uh, and, by the way, those sufferings are sure. For, the, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they're not only many and great, you can count on it, that if you live any length of time, you're going to go through some sufferings, some greater than others, and sometime in your lifetime, some easier sufferings than other lifetimes. You are going to suffer. Now that's real important because we live in a time in which preachers are telling you that you, if you trust Jesus Christ, your Savior, he'll make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. You won't suffer poverty. You won't suffer need. You won't suffer uh, uh, sickness. They, they're preaching deliverance, deliverance, deliverance in every way physically possible. And Paul's saying the exact opposite of that. He's saying this is a time of suffering and the sufferings of this present time you are going to suffer in this present time. And the thing that you're to keep in mind is not that God's going to deliver you from it, it's he's going to reward you later if you suffer for his glory. And it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So you need to keep in mind this is a time of suffering, but no matter what you suffer, it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse 19. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, a lot of times people will change verse 19, these words, creature to creation. But Paul's not just talking about the earth. The whole cre creation, but not, 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 in, not lifeless creation, all living creation. That's why it's creature instead of creation. Everything that's alive and breathes air or swims in the sea is suffering. I mean, you catch a fish and it's got scars on it because of these bloodsuckers that get on these things. Uh, every animal in the woods is running from another animal trying to eat it. Uh, every, every living thing on this earth is groaning and suffering. And, and, and so it's the creature. It's, it's, a, it's a real suffering, not, a, not, a, not, not the, the dirt bringing forth the weeds, but, but all of creation is going through a suffering. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That is... All of creation is suffering, waiting for God to change things, to take his sons and manifest them with glory, to bring peace to the heavens and peace to the earth. All of creation is looking for that, waiting for that. 
because it says, or for, it says in verse 20, for the creature was made subject unto vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that subjected the same in hope. That's saying all of creation is suffering because of Adam's sin. When Adam sinned, it didn't just cause suffering for mankind, it caused suffering for all of creation. And now all of creation is subject to hope, waiting and anticipating for God to manifest his glory and to bring peace back to this earth, to restore all things, as the prophets talked about. So it's all suffering, it says in verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. <laughs> Even the animals are going to be blessed when God restores the heavens and the earth. All of creature, creation is, is going to be, uh, be liberated from the bondage of suffering that sin brought into this world. So all it's not just us who suffers, all of creation is suffering, waiting for that manifestation of the sons of God, the glorifying uh, of all of God's believers. It says in verse uh, 22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, uh-oh, until now. Wow. You know, all you got to do is watch Discovery Channel, watch all the animals eat everybody, and <laughs> tigers running after zebras, and you wonder, what a way to die, yuck. <laughs> And you realize all of creation is groaning and travailing until the manifestation of the sons of God. But that verse says, groaning and travailing until now. As if, uh-oh, we're on the verge of seeing all of creation restored. You know what? The age of grace entered in right near the end where God was going to end the world, bring judgment upon it, and restore all things. The age of grace came in just at that point of time. So that's why it says until now. Some would look at that and say, oh, that means there's no more suffering after now. No, look at the next verse. It says, and not only they, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. We've received the spirit of adoption, right? But our bodies haven't yet caught up to our spiritual position, have it? We're waiting for the adoption of our body, the redemption of our body. And we're right on the verge. As if the age of grace is right on the end, the whole world is groaning and travailing until now, as if it's anticipating any second for God to change the situation of this earth. And the reason why, we have already received, received the first fruits of the Spirit. That is, we're halfway there. God saved us spiritually, put His Spirit within us. The only thing left is the redemption of our body, and that could happen at any moment. It's an anticipation that it could take place any second, as if all of creation has got its breath held, thinking, any time now, any time, it's almost here. We live in the last days. We live, uh, the age of grace itself has interrupted the last days of Israel where God was going to restore the earth and it could end at any time and all of creation is anticipating that. God has already made the first step in making, giving us spiritual life. The next step is physical life, restoring us. But until then, till the redemption of our body, it says even we groan within ourselves. How many of you didn't groan when you got out of bed this morning? Oh! Sanja complaining about her wrist, <laughs> trying to get life back into her hands again. We all groan within ourselves, waiting for that, the redemption of our body, the resurrection of the body. And the way this reads is we're almost right there. It's almost time. And so verse 24 and 5 say this, For we are saved by hope. You know what hope is? Joyful anticipation of what God has promised. And saved here doesn't mean saved us from our sins. That's Romans chapter 5. Jesus Christ already did that by the cross. If we're going to suffer, we're saved from our sufferings by realizing that there is a hope that's right on the verge of happening. That our suffering is light and it's but for a moment. And you're anticipating that resurrection of our body. So we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that that we see not, then we do with what? Patience. Wait for it. We have the joyful anticipation with all of creation that at any moment our bodies could be raised and glorified with Christ and receive an exceeding eternal weight of glory at the same time. 
and it could happen at any moment. So whatever you go through in suffering, suffer and give glory to, the God, to God for it. Realizing you have an opportunity to live and to suffer for his glory now, and no matter how severe or how long that glory should last, or that suffering should last, don't lose sight of hope. And it'll save you from despair. It'll save you from disappointment. It'll save you from discouragement. It'll save you from depression if you keep your hope on what God has promised to you, if you set your affections on things above. Be heavenly-minded, not earthly-minded, and God will reward it eternally soon. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for this wonderful truth. Thank you for such a glorious position. Thank you that you saved us and have given us eternal glory.